fair to say that the global pandemic upended most of our lives, especially in the workplace. As we emerge from the restrictions COVID-19 caused, it's clear the way we work has changed forever. For many, this transition has been a welcome one. Reduced commuting time, fewer late nights stuck at our desks, attending status meetings in our pyjama bottoms. But at what cost? Days stacked full with virtual meetings, significantly less human interaction, and the loss of a sense of team. The rapid adoption of new technology has made remote work more reliable and accessible than ever. But what other changes should companies be looking for? How do they adapt to and embrace hybrid workspaces for the better? How will it affect the recruitment and development of young talent? And what will it take to build and maintain company culture? On this episode of Good Things Happen, we're exploring the evolving world of work. Hello and welcome to Good Things Happen, the podcast. I am your host, Jorian Murray. I help businesses tell better stories. Today, I'm joined by two wonderful city people with expertise and insight into the working world. Naz Vahid, who has served the legal industry with banking and investment services for over three decades at City. She now heads up a global wealth management team that's dedicated to serving individuals and their firms from a whole range of elite professions. Scott Stimpfel, formerly an investment banker, he entered the world of academia, which he still does part-time at the NYU Stern Business School in New York, and his day job is running HR for City Institutional Clients Group's business solutions team. He is also an executive in residence at the University of Southern California's Race and Equity Center. We brought these two bright, informed minds together to make good things happen as we take a look at the changing world of work. Before we start, Naz, tell us a little bit about you. How did you get into finance and banking? Was this something that you told your mother at four years old that it was what you wanted to do? Absolutely not. I uh, wanted to be a journalist. So he asked me why I got here. I think that I overslept one day that I had to sign up for classes. And by the time I went to sign up, I had to take an economics course because that was one of the few things available. And once I took the economics course, I was literally on the edge of my seat the whole term. And I realized I love this. And hence, I switched to economics and went on to go and get my degree in it and then go and get my graduate degree. So in the process, I ended up becoming a finance person and working at City. And does it kind of surprise you when you look back at, you know, when you were at college that you're in a bank and is is a bank not what you thought it might be? No, absolutely not. I thought I was going to be traveling all over the world and cover wars and dictators and be this feminist individual who was going to absolutely change the way the world was going to see its leaders. Well, uh, we'll come on to this because I I think from within a bank, you can certainly affect change in the world. Scott, how about you? What what did you want to be when you were a little boy? Sure. And it's it's a great question. You know, I got into finance because growing up in Los Angeles, I would see people driving around with nice cars. And I would always say, I want that type of car. And I look around the license plate. And around the license plate, it would have a license plate holder of University of Southern California. And so I said, I need to go to that college. And then I started to talk to people at the school and they said, well, you need to go into finance. So I was actually brought into and interested in finance because of nice cars. And and it sounds shallow at first, but growing up in an underserved community, it's what attracted me to go to college. And it was an inspiration that I had when I first started out in my career. Have you bought a nice car yet? No. Not at all. My wife will not let me. (laughs) Very good. Very good. So uh, I think it's fair to say without any sense of hyperbole or exaggeration, that the last two years have been the most disruptive that any of us have experienced, but particularly with the world of work. Now, let's start with you. You run a, a big, amazing team, big offices, offices all over the United States. What were your fears two years ago when lockdown was happening? Were you worried that suddenly the world was going to stop? Oh, absolutely. I mean, look, I have been somebody who's grown up working in an office environment, thinking that the only way we can do well by our clients is to serve them together in an office environment. And the day we went in, I remember we're going to go off for two weeks and we're going to beat the curve. And, you know, here we are two years later. I thought, how are we going to manage this for two weeks? You know, how are our clients going to do it? 
And are we going to be productive? And here's the most amazing thing. Today, the NAS that would have said to you there are jobs that could never be done from home actually doesn't exist. I have realized our people work from home. They were extremely productive. And it was a different way that we communicated with clients and each other. So it's funny. What was my fear actually turned out to be a blessing. And we did really, really well in many levels over the last two years. Scott, I'm sure you agree with that and you would have heard this time and again. What do you think happened from a kind of almost a psychological point of view? What was it that made people react and become so much more productive, do you think? You know, I think we all came together. It was a time of crisis and we had wonderful leaders that brought people together under a common cause. And I think everyone was experiencing something that they hadn't experienced before. And so there was a sense of community that we were doing something as a group, as a team, as an organization. And I think that helped us kind of get through, as Naz was mentioning, some of these initial hurdles or mental blocks of how are we going to do this? And we were in a space that we didn't have answers to. It was very ambiguous. You know, the teamwork, the collaboration, and the positive mindset that we brought together each day through collaboration. And obviously, technology or the adoption of technology has accelerated enormously. We're conducting this podcast through Zoom. I'm looking at you through my computer. We're sort of well used to doing this now. So there have been many advantages with the changes. But what might we have missed being kind of separated, albeit we are connected by video conferencing, NAS? You know, it's interesting. We've hired a lot of people in the last two years. And I always, as a manager, was proud of myself for getting to know people, getting to know them beyond like their resume and where they went to school and what they studied, but more as who they are, what makes them happy. You know, somebody we had hired two years ago has aspirations to be an actress. And I like that about her. And I wanted to know that. So we missed some of that as a conversational piece. We also really missed learning from each other. I learned as a more junior banker how to speak to clients by listening to more senior bankers around me in a real situation. So I was worried. And at times, I'm still worried about the loss of ability to be an apprentice in this situation for each other. You know, how we deal with that going forward, it's going to be seen. And we're all going to take different tasks and ways to get to the right answer. I'd love to get your perspective with your academic hat on. I know that you teach graduates, undergraduates, and what do you hear from them that they're looking for from the world of work in the way that we would never have dared to think about when we were first starting out? I think a lot of the things that we look for as professionals, graduates now still continue to look for. They look for a sense of community. They look for the connection to people. It may just be done a little bit differently. So as Naz pointed out, how do we continue to develop people? And that's a big part of someone who's graduating from school. And I reflected this morning on my son came to me and he said, dad, I want to learn how to ride a bike. And Jorian, the first thing I did was I went out and bought a bike with training wheels. And that's because that's how I learned how to ride a bike. But I learned quickly that that's actually not the best way now, that there are balanced bikes. And so what it taught me was how we learned how to do things is going to be different than how this generation does. And this generation is very adaptable in how they learn. And so I think keeping that mindset of being agile within a corporation and how we develop our talent. And so we have to just keep that open mind and be open to new ideas and how to develop people. And I think also with you know, undergraduates coming out of college, they're looking for a hybrid work environment. This is how they experienced college the past, you know, two, three years now and going into, you know, year four. They're used to engaging in this way and that's how they've conducted their lives. And so they're looking for opportunities in workplaces that value sort of the hybrid work environment. Now, as both you and I have our own millennials at home who are starting in the world of work, I think they get a bad rep from our generation for being demanding and and what have you. What's your thought as a business leader recruiting guys? Does it get frustrating that, hey, they want so much and they're demanding? Or is this an audience and talent group that we can learn from? 
I think it's both. I have two kids that would be considered in their 20s, right? So I'm learning from them like Scott is learning from his. And one of the things I'm learning from them is that they grew up in a generation that got feedback a lot more regularly than, let's say, I did when I was growing up, both from parents, from teachers, and they want that from the environment that they work in. They want to know if they're doing right, what they should do differently. In the past, you would get that if you build a relationship with your mentor, your boss, your manager. Today, you have to seek that differently. But I do believe that the new generation actually knows how to do that a lot better than I did. They're not shy. They actually go out there. They find the right people to ask questions. You know, believe it or not, I get so many analysts put time on my calendar, not people who report to me, just people who want to get feedback and idea of how to succeed. That is a wonderful thing that this generation has that we don't have. There was also this almost silly version of life that people who trained me made me work really hard, do pitches that they never used just to make me work really hard. And they thought that is the way they were going to train me. And the reality is that is not the way we need to train people, that we can train people in a real situations. We can allow them to come on Zooms and be a silent participant and hear how we talk to clients. We don't have to do it the way we did it in the past. So the whole structure of the working week has changed, hasn't it? I remember my mum thinking when I resigned from my first job, she was shocked. It was a job for life. And, you know, we talked about nine to five. Obviously, we never did nine to five. We did a whole lot more than that. You'd never get messages at the weekend. But these blurred lines, Scott, is this progress? Is this a good thing? Or is it a health hazard? It could be a health hazard if we don't monitor it and we're not intentional. And I think we have to be mindful of keeping a balance in our lives. And so as organizations, we have to think about, and especially as leaders and managers, when do we have conference calls? You know, when can those start? You know, there used to be a time, Dorian, where we would commute into work and that was time, that was free time for our minds to kind of have that space between home and work where we could collect ourselves. And now conference calls start at 6.30, 6.30, 7 a.m., right? And so you don't have that time to separate. So it's important to make sure that as a manager, as a leader of teams, that you give people that opportunity to collect themselves in the morning and to be able to energize and get ready in the right mindset for work. And so the days do blur together and we have to make sure that we give ourselves that time, that we take walks in the morning, that we take breaks during the day to meditate, to you know, just even get up and stretch because sometimes, as we all know, we could be in Zoom calls all day. And one thing I've done with my teams is said, look, we do meetings for 15 minutes and 45 minutes, but we don't go the full hour. That's the other thing. At work, if you're going into a meeting, you might have to go into an elevator. So you might get five, 10 minutes in an elevator to go somewhere. At home, you go from Zoom call to Zoom call to Zoom call without having a break. So it's really important to take that mental break so that you can re-energize yourself throughout the day. Naz, you've run the law firm group for City for many years, hugely successfully. You're dealing with probably the profession that measures everything by the minute. Your business is expanding into all sorts of elite professions. What are you observing from them? Do they come to you for advice about how you run your teams? What changes do you see there? You know, it is really interesting you ask this because law firms, professional services, all of them are dealing with the same issues that we're dealing. We heard from a group of firms that, like us, had this return to work two or three times already and then went back home. And they realized that even if they say to people, I want you in three days a week, if those three days a week mean coming in and just staring at a Zoom in your office, that's not conducive to really good work environment. Actually, people become resentful of commuting and then sitting on a Zoom all day. So they have to be very direct about how to create communities, as Scott said, and how to make sure that people come in Perhaps on a certain day, you know, one of the law firms that I was just talking to said they're going to come back in February and they're going to talk about coming in, you know, maybe litigation group one day, 
uh, so that everybody in litigation is in. Or the next day could be everybody in bankruptcy. And then there will be a day that the whole floor is in. So you get a sense of community in it rather than try to say, okay, everyone, be really mature and show up to work without realizing what is actually happening. So I think they are struggling with it the same way that we are struggling with it. I do think the ones that will do well are the ones that understand the need for hybrid going long term and that the world has changed. The way we work has changed. It's not what it used to be. And in the world of professional services, of which banking is a part, rationally, a lot of businesses do the same thing as their competitors. But what really marks a company out, differentiates a company, is culture. Culture is so different. Are we in danger of losing that culture or diluting that culture, Scott? And if so, what can we do to maintain it or build it? Well, I think maintaining a hybrid environment where people still come into the office, because culture right, is your shared beliefs, your shared values. It's being able to connect with other humans, right, face-to-face and being able to engage. And so I think doing that sort of engagement intentionally, as Nas alluded to, is so important and making sure that we set up opportunities for people to engage. And if we continue to do that, our culture will continue to thrive. But we have to be intentional with what we do from a hybrid work perspective. And the other piece of this, Jordan, that is really important as we think about profound implications of culture is how does culture impact ethics, right? And when you're at work and you set the tone for an ethical environment, how is that set at home? So there's profound implications if we don't get this right. But I think the path that we're taking and the intentionality that we take with their decision making, I don't think we're in danger of losing culture. I think what we're going to be doing is building onto a already strong culture and adapting that culture as we move forward. And as I can see you nodding furiously, what would you add to that? And in your answer, maybe talk to us about, do you think cities got the kind of culture that can readily adapt to these changes? I am really actually proud of city, and this is not a commercial, but honestly, very proud that we were not the bank that was saying to everybody, come in, every single person has to come back to the office. And that is just the way you have to do it. The reason I'm proud of that is because we were listening rather than trying to just force our own set of older standards in the way work will get done. I do believe that that creates a modern version of a new environment that we are all going to be trained and build our cultures upon. I agree, Scott. I think that we have to be intentional, but I also believe that people want us to make those directives so that they come in in a certain day, so that they're sitting together, that we create opportunities for them to talk in conferences with each other, that we actually make them talk about themselves, not just work stuff. And if we do that right, our culture actually can improve. Because we are not just the culture of people in their 50s or 40s, but we are graduating to understand what the 20-year-olds need too. And together, we're going to create something that is for all of us rather than just fit one group set of thought processes. Lovely. It kind of brings me neatly on to another area I'd like to open up in this discussion, which is, I guess it's commonly called diversity, which can mean many things. Uh, Naz, I have had the absolute pleasure, and I'm not sucking up, I've had the absolute pleasure of working with you and your team, which is easily the most diverse culture I've ever seen. And it's so harmonious. So when you read about and hear about, hey, we've got to move to more diverse cultures, you must raise one eyebrow because I guess you've always had that. You know, it's interesting and it has happened a little bit naturally because we always talk about how we have to mirror our clients and our clients are trying to become more diverse the same way we are. We are realizing it's not just saying it, that we are more successful. We are more profitable if we have a diverse environment. But to make it happen, you have to be intentional about the way you hire. You have to be intentional about the way you train. Let's be very honest. If you come from a underrepresented group, whether it's from an economic point of view or a culture that necessarily did not have very formal dinners and lunches with clients, you have to teach people certain things. And if you do it in the route of, I want you to be successful, not that you have it wrong, it's really important. I will also tell you, you know, there was an example of somebody just interviewed for a job with us on Zoom. So They were from an African country and they had worn a very colorful outfit. 
the person who later was talking to me said to me, she was really smart, but she was dressed like a rainbow almost. And I said to myself, well, that's because when you want to make a strong comment, you actually in African culture dress in red and pink. And so she was trying to show her confidence. And the person just took, sat back and said, oh, I didn't think about it like that. And all of a sudden you're changing the way you looked at an interview. Who cares what she was wearing? Who was she? And did I like what she said? So that is how intentional you need to be sometimes about it and make sure that your biases do not get in the way of helping them. And when people come in, you got to guide them a little bit to make sure that they fit in, not that they have to change themselves, but they understand the structure of the business they're coming into. I hope that makes sense. Oh, it makes absolute sense. And talking of uh, diversity in terms of apparel, we have Scott in his splendid bow tie today, which uh, always makes me smile. Scott, you once said to me that the war for talent has been talked about for years, but is really on now. And diversity is very much at the heart of this. And I, I don't just mean it's, it's diversity of where you get people from. Talk to us about that. We, we've talked about the war for talent for many years, but it's at our doorstep now. We, we feel it as leaders and as managers as we're looking to bring in talent into the organization. We have to look and engage in communities and in universities and institutions and places where we may not have traditionally engaged before. And this is because there's so much great talent out there. And it's incumbent upon us, as Naz mentioned, to have a diverse workplace because it's going to result in a better company at the end of the day, a company that can provide better solutions to its clients. And so we must, as an organization, engage with and engage in areas that we haven't engaged traditionally before. And we have analytical tools now, technology to be able to do so. And we are now increasing the, if you want to call it a pipeline, of areas where talent can come from. And I think this is going to continue to change over the years as we look to bring in talent from, you know, we're a global company from all areas. And I think we're going to continue to be able to do this given the technology enhancements that we have, given the data enhancements that we have, that we're able to open opportunities to others. And I would just highlight what Naz mentioned about being able to bring people into the organization and it's a responsibility to give and empower people with that professional capital and the social capital to be successful in the organization. If we all come from different places, we're not all going to have the same information. So it's incumbent upon all of us to have the responsibility to share the professional capital and social capital knowledge that we have with those coming into the organization to make sure that they're successful. I'd love to open this up. I came from the world of advertising in the UK. And you know, when we did our graduate recruitment, the same agencies were chasing the same people from Oxford University or Cambridge University. And it almost became a competition to get the best people who were like cookie cutter. But I know, Scott, that you feel very strongly about this, that you know, banking had a similar kind of pipeline, but you're looking to really open that pipeline, aren't you? And how do you do that? What are the challenges? Is it presenting a bank to different sorts of people? Or is it getting your organization to understand that talent can appear in many forms and come from many different sources? I think it's both. You know, I, I came from community college. I went to Pasadena City College and transferred to the University of Southern California. And when I was in community college, I had never heard of an investment bank. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know there were careers possible in an investment bank. And so I think as we reach out to communities and as we reach out to universities where we haven't typically had a pipeline from talent, we're going to have to educate about what those opportunities are within the organization. And I think if we do so, people are going to find out that, wow, this is a great place to work. There's really talented people. They do really interesting work. It's global. And so as you think about you know our organization and thinking about the opportunities that we have to offer, it's really about educating people about what those opportunities are, and then also educating internally our leaders and talent and, and opening eyes right and minds around where talent can come from. Because to your point, we don't need to always go to the same places for talent. Uh, now, as I can see, you're nodding furiously again. Tell us your thoughts on this. I just could not agree more. 
you know, if I look at my workforce, some of my best, best bankers and best individuals have come in from uh, probably what we would have not considered the school of choice, but they are the top of that other school that they came from. They work really hard because they take the opportunity as a gift and they're willing to learn. Just their attitude is completely different. And I love that. I love taking that type of individual who's willing to learn, who is excited about the opportunity of joining, not taking for granted that I was just going to be given this opportunity. So I feel that if we go in and are thoughtful about who we bring in, not just what schools we bring it in, it's wonderful. I also always say you bring a smart individual to the office, ask them if they know other people. Don't worry what school they come from. Ask them if they know other people. They tend to participate in activities with people like themselves. And I find that as a great way to recruit in the new environment as well. I'd like also to talk about the attitude to when people wish to leave an organization. I'm pretty sure we, we've all worked in organizations where someone resigns and you know they get frozen out or you just can't bear them leaving. In a world where people are far more mobile, is this something that we need to embrace more, Scott? I think it is. And I think there are two ways to embrace it. One is to encourage mobility internally within an organization if possible. I think a lot of times people may feel that they have to leave the organization to find another opportunity. And organizations like City have really started to focus on mobility internally and what that looks like to make sure that we are actively and proactively reaching out to our talent and showing our talent opportunities internally. So they're not looking for an external recruiter to bring them outside of the organization. We are proactively reaching out to them and showing them the great opportunities. And to the extent if someone does choose an external opportunity, that we continue and help that person as they exit the firm and just ensuring that they had a wonderful experience because The odds are they're going to either come back or they're going to work for a client at some point in time. And, you know, although we we live in a big world, it is a small world, too. And we want to continue to have people be advocates of the firm, even when they leave, because they've had such a great experience. Can I add to that, Dorian? Please do. I've been with City about 35 years. I've had nine different jobs at City. So by standards, I might look like, oh, wow, she's been in the same company for a long time. But nine different jobs. So when you divide that, it's very average of when people stay in different jobs and move on to something else. I have to say I've been lucky that there have been managers that have looked out for me. So when I was looking to move, as Scott said, or was bored with a job, they created opportunities for me. And that has all happened for me in this one company, not different ones. But I also want to go back and say that when people resign, A lot of times it's because they're not getting fulfilled or they're looking for something that they don't see in our company. The interesting thing is I have an individual that left, went to another bank, said to me, it's not the same job. I just want to be more entrepreneurial and all of that. Went. And I remember I talked to him and I said, when you want to come back, if you want to come back, door is always open. And keep in touch. And we kept in touch on LinkedIn and all of that. Two years later, sure enough, he said, I miss the culture that we had uh, with you all in city. I want to give it another try. He's in. He's just getting promoted to another job. I just feel that it is really important not to get upset about somebody leaving, not to take it personal, but think it as growth. It's one way to grow the business. Okay. You're now allowed, Scott, a commercial break. What is it about City's culture that, you know, if there's any young talent listening, thinking about why they might want to join City, what is it about your culture that makes people want to come back? I think it's the people. It's it's the differentiator and it's, it's how we create opportunities and solutions for our clients and it's how we solve problems. And it's through the people and it's through the global organization and the globality and the people really, I think, our differentiators when it comes to culture, how we treat each other with respect, integrity, and it's an environment that's inclusive. And so as we talk a lot about diversity, it's not just having a diverse community and diverse teams, but also being inclusive of those team members and inclusive of ideas. 
And I think that's what makes the culture at City so rich. At the top of this conversation, I talked about extraordinary changes for all of us in the last couple of years, and it's only going to accelerate. Are you both excited by these changes? I mean, it's it's tiring. Let's be honest. Sometimes it's tiring, isn't it? You've got to learn a new technology and what plug goes into where and what have you. But broadly, Scott, are you are you excited about the, the, the challenges that, that face you in terms of building culture and building teams and recruiting talent? I am. The challenge is, I would view as opportunities, and technology has changed. And I'll, I'll give a quick story about my, my son, Jorian. His his first word was mama. And I said, his second word is going to be dad. And I got the Jimmy Fallon book that has dad and all the animals in it. And I would read it to him all the time. His second word was Google. And it's because we would always say, hey, Google, and would get the answers from Google. And he picked up on that. and. He continues to this day to go to Google for answers, you know, looking for results. And what is so interesting is how environments and how people have changed, right? And so as my son is is young, but as he starts to enter the workforce, we have to think about what that workforce is going to be, not only right now, because the future of work is right here, right now, but also what is it going to be in five years and 10 years When people like my son start to enter the workforce who are truly digital natives, who trust technology in a way that perhaps we don't. And so it's it's an exciting time now. And I think it's only going to become more exciting five, 10 years from now as we continue to embrace technology and communities of people entering our workforce. And I'd just like to touch on a changing characteristic. I hear a lot of talks and I read a lot of stuff about for the future, people probably need to be armed more with EQ than IQ in the way that we were maybe taught at school. Is this something you would agree with? Is this something that you're conscious of when you're interviewing people, their ability to deal with other people rather than necessarily what it is they know? Which brings me neatly on to a kind of a a closing question I like to ask in these podcasts. Our next uh, subject, we're going to be discussing innovation. So by way of trailer for that, but also I'd like your first thoughts on innovation. It's a word that gets so overused in my opinion, but what does innovation mean to you? I'll start with you, Naz. What do you think innovation means? Innovation means doing things differently than we've done it before to me. It's not just about technology, it's just about a different way of thinking. And I think innovation can happen at any time, in any company, at any business. You know, the business that I used to run is 50 years old. And if we don't innovate ourselves all the time, we're never going to be at the top of our game. So I don't believe that innovation belongs to a certain group or a certain generation. I think it's continuous and owned by all of us in the business. Scott? I would agree with everything that Naz said. And to add, it's a mindset. You have to have a, a mindset that is open to innovation, that is open to new ideas, and that the first response isn't no, but let me think about that, or yes, let's let's figure out a way to do it. And so, you know, having an open mindset is, I think, innovation in my perspective. And would you say that city's culture encourages that or embraces that? I believe so. It challenges us to have an innovative mindset, to challenge each other to be open to new ideas, to be open to new perspectives. And I think the more, going back to Naz's point, the broader community and family and diversity that we have within our city community, innovation is always going to be something at the forefront because we're going to have to continue to challenge each other with new ideas and new ways to solve problems and to create opportunities for our clients. So summing up this whole world of work, is there anything that we've not discussed when you were preparing your thoughts coming on today? Anything to do with the changing world of work that you would like to add? I think we discussed a lot. I do feel that It's not even finished in the way we are going to learn. I do believe that as we return to work, things are still going to continue to change because we're going to realize how can we do it differently better. I'm exploring job sharing in context of my business. That's something we've never thought about. But if there are jobs that are going to be remote, why couldn't we do job shares and do it longer during the day in front of our clients? So Let's come back and innovate and be open. One thing I want to say is 
Zoom actually made it easier for people sometimes to tell me what I can do better, people who are more junior than me. And I feel that without it, we're never going to be the best that we can possibly be. I really appreciate the fact that somehow it made it easier to just say what wasn't working. So I hope that continues as the new environment settles in as well. What a great way to finish. I've so enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so much for being our guests. And good things really do happen when you get bright minds together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The views expressed herein are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of City Global Markets, Inc. or its affiliates. All opinions are subject to change without notice. Neither the information provided nor any opinion expressed constitutes a solicitation for the purchase or sale of any security. The expressions of opinion are not intended to be a forecast of future events or a guarantee of future results. 